uh, at um, COP27 in uh, Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt and also online participants. Um, we've got a good lineup of a great lineup of uh, speakers and we're looking forward to hearing from them. Just a few words of introduction and then we'll get right to it. Um, so this event is being sponsored by the EU uh, funded project titled, um, as you can see from the slide, Pathways to Reducing Black Carbon and Methane in the Arctic, um, Impacting Arctic Climate and Air Pollution. Uh, the event is being organized by the EU funded project titled Arctic Black Carbon Impacting Climate and Air Pollution, ABC ICAP is the name of it. Um, and I'm the Russell Shearer, the project coordinator. Uh, the ABC ICAP project aims to contribute to reducing black carbon and methane emissions from specific sources which impact on the Arctic by promoting national and international and regional uh, cooperation, um, uh, building and sharing relevant knowledge, raising awareness, engaging uh, stakeholders and performing expert analysis. Uh, we're, today's session will have five speakers in this session, uh, three will virtually, and the first one will be virtually, uh, two in person, and then we will uh, address, and they will all address different aspects of the issue um, from different sources to impacts to mitigation uh, actions. Uh, and then the presentations will be followed by a question and answer session and uh, panel discussion. Um, and so we'll see how time goes, but the plan right now is to uh, allow one question at the end of each um, presentation and then more broader discussion after that in the panel. Uh, so with that, um, I think uh, we'll just start with our first speaker, who's uh, Jessica McCarthy and uh, Villeveco Parnu, uh, and they will present the Arctic on fire. I think Jessica is speaking first. It's all yours, Jessica. Thank you, Russ. You look quite tan. I hope everyone is there. Having a great afternoon. Uh, my name is Jessica McCarty, and I am an associate professor of geography at Miami University in the US. And I'm speaking here today. I'll co present with my colleague, Vila Beckel Baunu, who's from the Finnish Environment Institute in uh, Helsinki. We want to talk to you about the current situation of wildland fire in the Arctic and the boreal. Some key takeaways. Uh, for the audience and for policymakers, that there is an increasing trend of fire activity and fire emissions above 60 degrees north globally since the mid 2000s. In fact, we see more fire at 60 degrees north sometimes than we do in the temperate zone. There are intercontinental transport of smoke and pollution that affects the Pan Arctic already. This is not a future problem. And that future Arctic fire regimes will be more extreme, and this is mainly due to climate change, but there are um, solutions and pathways forward. In a review paper that our, um, our expert group on short-lived climate forcers of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program published in 2021, pulled together from more than uh, 250 peer-reviewed publications globally, we found 10 risk factors that are increasing Arctic fire risk and um, affecting the Arctic fire regime. Of these 10, nine show an increase in fire by mid and late century. Um, so this increase is happening now. And as you can see, there is a symmetry across um, the Arctic. The Arctic is connected. So what is happening in North America is also happening across the Nordics and Eurasia. Um, it is not just our group that has found this. So Grid Arendelle uh, published a, a really nice report um, in 2021 showing that uh, climate change in the Arctic is also um, affiliated not just with increases in Arctic fire risk, uh, but also black carbon concentrations and deposition. As is visualized here, the purple shows our, uh, black carbon concentrations uh, throughout a seasonal distribution of the red and slightly orange uh, wildfire activity across the Panarctic and Panboreal. And that this black carbon is also um, affiliated with um, continuous permafrost extent and what's really important for thinking about solutions, uh, peat extent. Fire emissions are really important at the high latitudes. Um, extreme fire years, uh, like in 2020, uh, can outpace anthropogenic sources of black carbon, um, including things like flaring, emissions from transport and even residential. 
And these sources of black carbon originate within the Pan-Arctic. Here in this bar graph, we have split it by whether or not the fires are north of 60 degrees, which is a slightly lighter color, or north of 65 degrees. Um, so it's a, this can be quite significant during extreme wildland uh, fire years. While there is a lot of fire happening um, throughout North America, um, and sometimes even extreme fires, uh, as we have seen in Sweden and Finland and even Greenland in 2017 and 2019, the majority of our fires um, are originating from Siberia and the Russian Far East. In fact, about 68% of all Arctic fire activity uh, originates from the Russian Federation. And with that, I'd like to turn this over um, to my colleague, Vila Beko. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, as introduced, I'm Vileva Kopano from the Finnish Environment Institute. And um, a very recent example of these unprecedented fires uh, in the Arctic uh, is the activity in Alaska just this summer, uh, as reported by Rick Thoman here. Um, 1.3 million hectares uh, burned in Alaska, which was the seventh highest burn area since 1950. And furthermore, south of the southwest Alaska witnessed unforeseen amount of tundra wildfires in that region. So we're getting new areas uh, uh, were experiencing these extreme wildfires every year. Next slide, please. The smoke from these fires doesn't only affect the neighborhood of that fire. Uh, Finnish Meteorological Institute has a, a measurement station in the center of Finland, and they've been over there able to detect smoke coming from wildfires uh, originating in Russia and from Finnish point of view beyond Moscow, so quite far away. Uh, furthermore, smoke from fires from North America have been detected in Europe. Uh, so we can see the smoke from these wildfires can travel uh, intercontinentally and in really uh, large distances. And next slide, please. Therefore, we need Pan-Arctic collaboration to be able to meet the challenges of the increasing fires in the Arctic. This means large networks for collaboration, uh, research and sharing of new technologies, and taking into account how human activity impacts these fires now and in the future. Our project, the APC ICAP, has begun this work by organizing webinars uh, between European and North American fire experts already. And we plan to build on these activities and networks to go forward to fight the increase in Arctic fires. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Anna. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Jessica and uh, Villaveco. Uh, if there's any quick question uh, before we move on to the next speaker. No? Okay. Um, so the, se the second speaker is um, Dan Rutherford, and he's with the um, uh, ICCT, <laughs> International Council for Clean Transportation. He's going to give us a presentation um, on the impacts from Arctic shipping. It's all yours, Dan. All right. Great. Thanks, Russell. And I'm very happy to be here to talk about some research that my colleagues at the ICCT have completed uh, about the impact of black carbon emissions from ships in the Arctic. Uh, and then measures to mitigate those. Um, as a bit of background, I lead the aviation and shipping programs at the International Council on Clean Transportation. Uh, we're a research-based nonprofit that advises governments worldwide on how to better control emissions from uh, all of the major modes of all of the major modes of transportation. Um, so today I'll be talking to you about uh, recent trends in black carbon emissions uh, from the shipping sector, um, why these are an important uh, both health pollutant and climate pollutant, uh, and then walk you through three recommendations for policymakers on how to mitigate their impact. Uh, next slide, please.
Could we load the presentation for Rutherford, please? All right, uh, next slide, please. So um, since we might be time constrained, I thought I'd actually start with the key messages here. Um, what you should come away with today is knowing uh, that black carbon is a, thank you, uh, an important climate pollutant and also a health impact uh, for the Arctic and communities located near the Arctic. Um, You'll learn a little bit more about the magnitude of black carbon emissions uh, from shipping uh, and how they've increased over the past six years. Uh, I'll walk you through the benefits of switching towards distillate fuels in shipping away from the current prevalent use of uh, residual fuels like heavy fuel oil. Uh, and then I'll talk you through three concrete proposals to governments for how to mitigate the impact of these emissions. So let's talk about the magnitude of the emissions first. Um, black carbon is an important climate pollutant. Uh, it's uh, emitted due to the incomplete combustion of residual fuels uh, in marine engines. Um, depending upon the time scales of the metrics, black carbon is responsible for between seven and 20% of the total climate impact of shipping emissions. 7% uh, using a 100 year global warming potential 20% using a 20-year uh, global warming potential. Um, according to IMO's fourth greenhouse gas study, black carbon emissions from ships increased by about 10, uh, 12% from 2020 to 2012 to 2018. Now, black carbon is not only a climate pollutant, but it's also a health hazard. Uh, the solid particulate matter that ships emit, uh, which includes black carbon, were estimated to have caused more than 6,000 premature de deaths in uh, 2012, above a 40 degree north latitude. Um, now ICCT in its own inventory uh, estimated that ships emitted about uh, 1,500 tons uh, of black carbon above 60 degrees north in 2015. Uh, about 200 tons of that fell within the IMO's limited definition of the Arctic which is shown in the blue outline on this map. Um, unfortunately, the uh, black carbon emissions from ships have been increasing even more rapidly in the Arctic than the global average. Um, the left panel on this chart shows uh, how much black carbon was emitted from ships within IMO's Arctic, uh, specifically from heavy fuel oil. Uh, that shows a 72% increase from 2015 to 2019. Uh, the middle panel is showing the same figure, but from all fuel use from ships in the Arctic. So that's heavy fuel oil, distil distillate fuel, and also uh, liquefied natural gas. Uh, that in increased even faster, 85% between 2015 and 2019. Uh, and this compares to a global increase of only 8% over that four year period. So the big takeaway is that black carbon emissions from ships are increasing 10, 10 times faster within the Arctic than the global average. So what's the quickest and easiest way to control these emissions? Uh, quite simply, it's to shift from the use of residual fuels uh, to distillate fuels, um, essentially the diesel fuel similar to what are used for on-road vehicles today. Uh, and doing so would have a number of benefits. Um, it would reduce black carbon emissions by 50 to 80% relative to heavy fuel oil. Uh, it would also enable, uh, uh, it would reduce air pollution. Uh, that would be sulfur oxides, particulate matter, et cetera, without using uh, exhaust gas scrubbers, which increase water pollution as a byproduct of their operation. Um, Distillate would also enable the use of diesel after-treatment technologies, 
including diesel particulate filters and electrostatic precipitators, uh, which can uh, cut particulate emissions by more than 90%. Uh, and lastly, using distillate would reduce the, both the risk and the expected cost of fuel spills in the marine sector. Um, according to our estimate, cleaning up a distillate spill costs about 30% less than cleaning up an equivalent spill uh, using low sulfur fuel oil uh, and 70% less costly than cleaning up an HFO spill. Um, so let's talk a little bit about ways that we can mitigate uh, these emissions from the shipping sector. Um, you may have heard that the uh, International Maritime Organization is moving to ban the use of heavy fuel oil in the Arctic. Um, that uh, is, would have the impact of reducing black carbon emissions from the combustion and also mitigating some of the, fuel, the, the spill risk that I just mentioned. Um, the challenge is that there are a number of large loopholes uh, to IMO's approach. Um, ships, so the, the full ban will take effect uh, in, uh, in two years time, uh, but it has waivers and exemptions that are built into it. So for example, ships that, are, uh, that were uh, purchased after 2010 will have a five-year exemption from the requirements. Uh, and then near Arctic states, uh, including Russia, the US, Canada, Norway, and Denmark, uh, have the right to grant five-year waivers uh, for their ships operating in their waters. Uh, and so as a result, the HFO ban will not take full effect in reality until July 2029. Um, now, the, if governments move to not grant waivers to their ships, it would have a significant impact in cutting black carbon emissions. Uh, and this chart just shows uh, if uh, countries do not exempt their ships, uh, it would lead to a, about a 70% reduction in the use of HFO within the IMO Arctic. Um, the large majority of that would come from Russian flagged ships operating in Russian waters. So that highlights the importance of that country in efforts to control these emissions. Um, overall, if the full exemptions and waivers are granted, uh, we estimate that the HFO ban uh, would still allow about three quarters of the HFO fleet uh, to operate in the Arctic through 2029. Uh, and the policy would only reduce HFO carriage by 30%, HFO use by 16%, and black carbon emissions by 5%. So you can see that there's a lot of room for improvement uh, if IMO does go and eliminate these loopholes. Uh, the second policy that could be refined to control these emissions uh, is in Europe. Uh, under the refuel, sorry, the fuel EU maritime proposal, um, Europe is proposing a goal-based approach to reduce the carbon intensity of marine fuels for ships that are operating to and from its ports. Um, currently, fuel EU maritime does not include black carbon emissions, uh, and a simple step that Europe could take to uh, reduce the impact on the Arctic is to, uh, in essence, require the use of distillate fuels uh, for uh, voyages that are leaving its ports and operating within the Arctic region. Uh, and that could reduce uh, black carbon emissions from those voyages by between 50 and 80%. Uh, the final uh, policy recommendation is pretty simple. Um, the International Maritime Organization has a series of uh, climate standards for ships that are currently all based on either a fuel consumption or a carbon dioxide basis only. Uh, they do not include other short-lived climate pollutants, including black carbon, methane, and nitrous oxide. Uh, so this approach has a potential to uh, promote fuels that emit less carbon when burned, but emit larger amounts of these co-pollutants. And as a result, the net climate impact can actually increase from their use. Um, so there, there is a, um, a paper into the next MEPC meeting uh, from the Solomon Islands Pacific Environment and the Inuit Circumpolar Council uh, to reform IMO's approach and do a uh, full life cycle assessment of all relevant pollutants. Uh, and this would help avoid some of the unintended consequences I just mentioned. 
so that's all for me. Just those three policy recommendations for people to think about as we uh, start to address this in, these important impacts from the shipping sector. Back to you, Russell. Uh, any quick question for uh, Dan before we move to the next speaker? Okay. Thanks very much, Dan. We'll uh, get back to you uh, during the panel session. Our next speaker is uh, going to be Lisa Cooper Kalak, and she's the, the president of the Inuit Circumpolar Council in Canada. And she's going to give us a presentation on um, building alliances at the International Maritime Organization, IMO, uh, with a focus on black carbon and methane emissions. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you for this introduction. And Andrew, thank you for the um, presentation up on the screen. So yes, um, I'm pleased to be speaking to you today about building alliances at the International Maritime Organization with a focus on black carbon and methane. We are all North and South dependent on a clean, safe, zero emissions global shipping fleet. And this is even more true for us Inuit in the Arctic. Three things I'm hoping to, to for you to take away from this presentation is Inuit depend on clean, responsible shipping to safeguard marine resources and our relationship with the marine ecosystem is critical to our well-being and our way of life. Secondly, shipping black carbon emissions can be reduced by switching to available, cleaner fuels. Now, black carbon can be reduced immediately. We just need to act. And thirdly, Inuit are the first indigenous people to be granted provisional consultative status at the IMO, which will give us a seat at the table to call for shipping rules that reduce climate impacts. Next slide. Allow me to tell you a bit first about who we are as Inuit. We are a marine people who live in the circumpolar region and our homelands transcend national borders, which makes us truly an international people. Inuit have rights to a vast coastline and marine region. We are over 180,000 people, one people, one nation. We live in four different countries in Chukotka, which is part of Russia, in the Far East, in Alaska, part of the United States, in Canada, and in Greenland, which is um, related to Denmark. Slide three. We're part of the Arctic ecosystem. As I often say when I speak to our culture, our culture and biodiversity in the Arctic are intricately tied. Importantly, we depend upon the Arctic sea ice, flow edge, and polynias for our food security. Our knowledge of the Arctic includes the ocean and coastal seas, the migration and patterns of marine animals, current and wind observations, knowledge of ice and of the ice movements. All this knowledge, when co-developed with science, builds a greater understanding of the changes the Arctic is experiencing that directly impacts shipping. As well, we're bound to the marine environment and to the shipping industry. It's an essential service. Next slide. And we know that Arctic shipping level traffic are increasing and we see it. And the traffic will continue to increase significantly as the ice melts. The statistics you see on this slide are from a recent Arctic Council report looking at ship traffic over a six year period, showing a 75% increase in distance sailed and 25% increase in unique ships. 
NASA figures show ice melt melting 13% decade per decade. It's enormous, and we know that um, this will cause more ships to arrive, to pass through the Arctic. Next slide. Inuit, we are on the front line of the climate crisis. Inuit Nunat, our homeland, is warming three to four times faster than the rest of the planet. As the recent IPCC report has outlined, loss of ecosystems and their services has cascading and long-term impacts on people globally, especially for indigenous peoples and local communities who are directly dependent on ecosystems to meet basic needs. Given dire predictions and already observed impacts, action to reduce climate emissions from shipping is urgently needed, particularly black carbon, a short-lived climate force which is 20% of shipping's carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, has a disproportionately high impact in the Arctic. Black carbon can be reduced overnight, in some cases by 80%, by switching to cleaner fuels like distant. Next slide. We're also concerned about the shipping industry's increased methane emissions. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas, so reducing global sources will benefit the Arctic. Methane is the second largest contributor to climate change and more potent than CO2 at warming the atmosphere. A major source of methane in the shipping industry is from the use and potential use of LNG as a marine fuel. We need to support alternative marine fuel solutions other than LNG over the next years to reduce methane emissions from the shipping center sector. Next slide. Working towards efficient, clean, zero emission and safe Arctic shipping is in all of our best interest and will require a collaborative effort. It's because shipping is so important to us that we began an engagement with IMO. IMO consultative status for ICC will ensure that our unique and independent voice, our Inuit knowledge, perspectives and issues are heard within this important decision-making forum. Next slide. To sum up, Inuit, we depend on clean, responsible shipping to safeguard marine resources. Our relationship with the marine ecosystem is critical to our well-being and way of life. Shipping black carbon emissions can be reduced by switching to available cleaner fuels now. Black carbon can be reduced immediately. We just need to act. Lastly, Inuit are the first Indigenous people to be granted provisional status at the IMO, which will give us a seat at the table to call for shipping rules that can reduce climate impacts. And we wish to do this in partnership, in alliance with small island developing states uh, and other allies within the IMO and around the world. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Lisa. Any quick question for uh, Lisa before we move on to the next presentation? No? Okay. Thanks very much. That was very good, and hopefully you're staying around for the panel. Uh, our next yes, speaker... Thank you. Our next speaker will be um, Lena Hoagland Isaacson, and she's with the uh, IASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Uh, and her presentation will be on uh, reducing methane emissions from human activities globally and in the Arctic Council member and observer countries. Go, Lena. Um, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Down or up? Okay. Okay, is this good? 
OK. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. So um, and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak in this event. Uh, my name is Lena Höglund Isaksson, and uh, I'm a senior research scholar at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria, where I have been for almost 20 years uh, working on uh, methane emissions, so global um, inventories for methane emissions, as well as uh, policy scenarios, so building scenarios uh, into the future. Um, so maybe you can take the next slide, please. OK, okay. so le let me first just um, remind everyone why it's important that we, uh, uh, that we re reduce uh, methane emissions. Uh, as you know, you might know, um, we are heading for um, uh, for a temperature increase of 1.5 uh, degrees, uh, probably in the next uh, few years. Uh, and uh, if we continue with the business as usual, we will uh, uh, pass 1.5 degrees, probably um, around um, pro probably before 2050 with only uh, CO2 emissions. So it's really important that we reduce the CO2 emissions. But uh, in the short term, uh, you can see here the, the lower red line, that's the warming from methane emissions, which is around half a degree only from methane emissions. And um, so in the short term, uh, one of the few options that we still have to, to stay below 1.5 degrees is to significantly reduce methane emissions, in particular to, to keep below 1.5 degrees in the next two decades. So let me start with um, a few key messages from this presentation. Uh, you might know about the Global Methane Pledge, uh, which, uh, which, which was um, uh, negotiated in the last COP in Glasgow. Uh, the signatories of the, of the Global Methane Pledge is uh, around uh, 130. Uh, it was 125 when I did this slide. Uh, and they emit uh, about 54% of the global anthropogenic methane emissions. Um, but uh, the Global Methane Pledge signatories, together with the Arctic Council member and observer countries, uh, emit as much as 87% of uh, global anthropogenic methane emissions. Uh, for the Arctic member countries, it's the oil and gas uh, activities that dominate uh, methane emissions. And this is also the sector where there is the largest potential to reduce emissions significantly at a very low cost uh, in the next few years. Uh, for the observer countries, uh, it's, uh, coal mining is uh, the most important sector for reducing uh, emissions uh, very fast and uh, they account for uh, a quarter of the emissions in the observer countries. Uh, and finally, uh, emissions from the waste and uh, agricultural sectors, these are the most difficult to uh, reduce in the short term. Uh, so this picture shows now the total uh, anthropogenic uh, methane emissions. Uh, and the green one is the emissions that are from the signatory countries of the Global Methane Pledge. And as you can see, I don't know if it's possible, no. Uh, if you can, you can see in the right uh, graph, uh, these countries, if they follow through on the pledge, which means reducing, uh, coll um, uh, collectively reducing methane emission emissions by 30% between 2020 and 2030. And if they follow through on that, uh, then uh, they will re re be able to reduce, uh, that, that's the, the slope of the green uh, to, to the right. 
and it would mean then that we come to a, a emission level that is comparable to the level where we the world was in 2010. So we will uh, need more significant reductions in methane emissions. Um, and uh, here I have split the global methane emissions into three different uh, country groups. Uh, the first one is for the Arctic member countries, and the one in the middle is the observer countries. And to the right, you have the rest of the world. And as you can see, uh, for the rest of the world, most of the emissions are covered uh, currently under the Global Methane Pledge. Uh, for the Arctic Council countries, uh, there, uh, there is a top level here, which is the Russian Federation, which is not cur uh, currently in the pledge. Uh, uh, while, so the, the dominating uh, countries here is the US and Russia. And for the observer countries, um, you can see that the major players there that are not in the pledge, it's India and China. Uh, but if we, um, if we would combine these emissions, so the ones that are under the Global Methane Pledge with the Arctic Council member and observer countries, we would cover 87% of the global methane emissions. So the Arctic Council could be a fora here for uh, pushing for more uh, methane reductions in uh, these countries that are currently not the major players uh, who are not currently in the Global Methane Pledge, whether it's under the pledge or uh, through some other uh, kind of uh, arrangements. Uh, so let, let us look at also where the different sources are for methane emissions in these three groups. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's, it's very uh, region-specific where methane is actually emitted. Uh, in the Arctic uh, member countries, uh, emissions from oil and gas uh, systems dominate emissions. Uh, in the observer countries, uh, you can see that there is significantly more from agriculture, in, in particular rice cultivation, but also from coal mining. Uh, and lastly, in the rest of the world, we have then a lot more from the agricultural sector. But in both, um, in both the obser uh, observer countries and, and the rest of the world, we also have very rapidly increasing emissions from the waste and wastewater sectors. And these are the potentials for reductions in the short term. So meaning that the potentials for reducing emissions using existing technologies. Uh, so what we can really do in the next 10 years. Uh, and here, you, as you can see, the big uh, reductions is in the oil and gas sectors. That's the brown parts here. Uh, and these are uh, reductions that mostly come actually at the net profit because uh, the gas that you recover or from reduced leakages, can, can, I mean, it goes to the markets and you can sell it. But, um, but it doesn't happen, <laughs> mainly because of the very high profit margins in this uh, sector. So uh, reductions in methane emissions, even if they are profitable uh, on the paper, it's not enough to compete with a very high profit of actually producing more uh, oil and gas. So we need uh, urgently regulatory frameworks here to really push for um, binding uh, reductions uh, in, I mean, in um, from the oil and gas industry. Uh, and then uh, we have the uh, coal mining, uh, which is China, Indonesia, yeah, are big um, here, as well as in the, in the right one. And there we also have uh, ventilation, air, methane uh, oxidation technology, which is uh, not coming at a profit, but at a low cost. Uh, and finally, uh, for the, as, I, as I said, the, for the waste, it's about um, uh, uh, improving the infrastructure for waste treatment, in particular in many of the 
developing countries with rapidly growing uh, populations. But the effect of that will probably only be seen after 2030 because, uh, because of the waste that is already in landfills will continue to uh, generate uh, methane in the, uh, beyond 2030. So, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Lena. Any quick question for Lena uh, before we move on to our last speaker? Great. Thanks very much, Lena. That was uh, very good, and hopefully you'll be, be able to join us for the panel discussion. Uh, our fifth and final speaker is Irina Isakova, and she's with Carbon Limits uh, in Norway, and she's going to give us a presentation on uh, reducing emissions from the oil and gas sector, lessons learned from the last decade. So... Uh, Irene will be joining us online. There's, well, that's me. Hi, everyone. There you go. Can you hear me okay? I assume you can. Um, and I'm seeing my slides in the distance. So excellent. Hi, everyone. And uh, first of all, thanks a lot for uh, being able to participate in this event and to present um, the lessons learned by Carbon Limits, working in the oil and gas sector over the last many years, but uh, today I'll focus on the lessons learned over the, la the last decade. My name is Irina and I've been with Carbon Limits over the last seven years, uh, watching the changes uh, happening, the ones I'm going to be talking about. Uh, our company is a climate consultancy based in Norway and uh, we focus on climate mitigation with a specific focus on the oil and gas sector. So, um, like the other speakers, would like to start with the key takeaways uh, first and come back to them throughout my presentation. First of all, um, from the, what we observe, there is important progress um, that is happening already in the oil and gas sector when it comes to uh, short-lived climate pollutants, in particular methane, black carbon, particulate matter, and so on. Uh, many of the sources are being addressed, many of the sources of emissions are being addressed but we see um, very uh, drastic ch uh, yeah, changes and differences between the different regions and countries. This is something that uh, Lena has also been presenting in her previous presentation. At the same time, we see new technologies for emissions monitoring, and here in particular, I'm thinking of methane, um, emerging and available uh, to the stakeholders, and access to this data can enable better decision making. So there is more information available to plan and strategize and uh, develop mitigation plans which allow companies and countries to act quickly. But at the same time, uh, this needs to be coupled with more capacity building because the level of knowledge and understanding of these technologies is different across different regions. And also, as Lena said, uh, more focus on policy um, implementation. And I'll come back to that. And finally, um, again, maybe more on the methane side, um, the issues of methane emission in the oil and gas sector is quite complex. Uh, there are multiple sources that are not visible to the naked eye. Um, there is many research papers uh, coming out weekly, I would say, on this topic, many new technologies being available for monitoring and mitigation, which makes it complicated for operators in certain regions to follow these discussions and to be able to prioritize them. So I would like to start with one large category of emission sources in the oil and gas sector, which is flaring, uh, which I'm sure all of us are very familiar with. Uh, flaring, emissions from flaring of associated petroleum and gas, APG, have been around for the longest time and have been in focus for many years now. Unfortunately, as you see from the graph, um, the, the last decade uh, has been called a decade of stalled progress on flaring because this uh, black line that you see here, it's stabilized after reducing. And what you see here is not the overall emissions from flaring, but rather uh, flare intensity, which means amount of gas APG flared divided by the amount of uh, yeah, oil and gas produced in the different countries. So we see that flare intensity has uh, flattened out, uh, we can say, but it doesn't mean that certain countries have not done a lot to reduce their emissions. Actually, there are quite a few success stories um, across different regions, and here you have a few examples of 
US, Canada, and Colombia have uh, been able to drastically reduce their flaring intensity from their oil and gas operations. We are talking about 50 to 70% reduction over the last 10 years. They have a few, um, sorry? They have a few common traits uh, for the success stories that we're observing. Um, all of the countries managed to um, have strictly enforced regulations. And here we are not only talking about strict regulations, but also following up on um, these regulations being enforced properly, which often means having enough administrative capacity and resources to follow this up, and also having some penalties for non-compliance with the regulations. In addition, a uh, common trait for these countries is that uh, they have a domestic gas market that incentivizes associated gas recovery. And this can manifest itself in many different forms, but for example, associated gas can have preferential access uh, when it reaches the transmission gas pipeline, or uh, it can mean uh, yeah, good market conditions in terms of price for this gas and good remuneration to the operators that actually recover the gas. So seeing both the success stories, but also the stalled progress across other countries, uh, we think that there is still um, quite a bit of work remaining to be done on uh, addressing flaring. So one of the items on the to-do on the next steps is to continue uh, focus and pressure by the international capital markets and consumers uh, to address emissions from the oil and gas sector. We are already seeing this now. We are seeing that uh, the buyers of oil and gas products, as well as uh, uh, investors, in these industries, they're increasingly looking for better reporting and better um, action planning from the oil and gas sector. And we believe that it is important to continue to um, put this pressure onto the oil and gas sector to reduce further their emissions. And if they cannot be reduced immediately, then to have an actionable plan on how they're planning to do this in the future. Another step that we see very important is to focus on enforcement of already existing regulations. Um, many countries have in place quite strict regulations when it comes to flaring. Many ban flaring, so routine flaring, as part of normal operations. Many have high fees for uh, flaring or for emissions that um, are produced as a result of flaring. Yet, uh, we see that they're not properly enforced everywhere. So focusing on making sure that there is uh, sufficient administrative resources and also the yeah, punishment for non-compliance in place uh, should ensure that the existing regulations will be enacted and will lead to the results that we're expecting. And then finally, uh, focusing on finance and barriers uh, for uh, gas flare utilization can also be one of the next steps. Um, many of the large flares have already been addressed. So um, many of the flares that we are observing now are of medium and small scale. There are still uh, large flares remain as well, but many are of smaller scale, which makes the economics of these projects quite challenging because um, in order to utilize um, APG, you need large investments in gas uh, processing infrastructure and also sometimes gas transportation infrastructure in order to bring the gas to the market. So it requires large upfront capex, which the companies um, do not always have the means to uh, finance. And this is again echoing what Lena has been talking about. Uh, maybe some more profitable ventures are prioritized over this um, climate mitigation measures in competition for resources and investments. So this was covering our experience related to flaring and the other large share of uh, emissions coming from the oil and gas sector, especially short-lived climate pollutants, are direct releases of methane. And here we are not talking about combustion of methane, we are talking about direct releases into the atmosphere, sometimes called fugitive emissions, sometimes called uh, leaks and vents, basically everything that is directly uh, released into the atmosphere without combustion. And from our experience, what we knew 10 years ago is still true uh, today. So uh, 10 years ago, there were already mature technologies for mitigation um, of methane emissions. 
and they remain to be valid, they remain to be uh, feasible and available today. Uh, we also know that many of the abatement options for methane emissions in the oil and gas sector, they require much smaller capital investment than, for example, gas utilization infrastructure, which makes them uh, much more economically viable options uh, for the oil and gas sector. Uh, and as Leander said um, as well, methane emissions in the oil and gas sector is some of the most lucrative uh, mitigation opportunities for methane um, across all sectors uh, that are meeting this way. And what we also knew and um, are still confirming now is that the emission estimates from the oil and gas sector are high at certain. So a few things we've learned um, over the last decade, and uh, one of the big things that has emerged is uh, a number of quantitative technologies, uh, monitoring technologies that have become available. Just like for uh, monitoring of flaring, we now can uh, monitor uh, methane with satellites from space. Uh, I'm sure you have seen over the last uh, years uh, many news articles related to leaks and vents that have been observed from space. This is important because uh, remote monitoring allows us to make some new conclusions about the nature of emissions, uh, methane emissions from the oil and gas sector. And what we are seeing is that there is um, high variability in uh, emissions from the oil and gas sector. Not all sites are alike. Here is an example of one of the regions that we've explored but this is true for regions across the world. We are seeing that a small number of sites are responsible for a large amount of methane emissions. Here, 3% of the sites are responsible for over 60% of emissions. And this is important because if we are able to see where these 3% of the sites are and uh, develop mitigation plans to address emissions from these 3% of the sites, then we have a large share of the problem solved, over 60% of the emissions solved for this specific, specific case, of course. Um, and we are seeing that many of the companies and governments are also uh, finally putting methane in focus. We are seeing that many uh, companies are purchasing equipment and data that allow them to uh, do leak detection and repair and DAR. This is um, a process to not only identify uh, leaks from the facilities, uh, and mitigate them straight away or during next maintenance, but also to map out other sources of methane emissions and plan how companies can mitigate them in the future. In addition, many companies have joined international initiatives related to methane emissions in the oil and gas sector, and here are a few. Um, these uh, initiatives are central to making sure that there is available information, that there is transparency related to, to methane emissions, um, and that there is mitigation being planned. And finally, on the government level, uh, the emissions, methane emissions are being addressed through regulation. Uh, we are seeing a few successful examples of not only uh, implementing regulation, but actually already enforcing it. So on the way for methane, we um, also believe that uh, we need to accelerate action we see uh, successful examples of mitigation happening both on the company level and on regulatory level on the country level, um, but we need to act quickly. So we have uh, 85 months left before 2030, and in order to achieve 1.5 degree uh, target that we are all aiming for, methane emissions should be reduced by 40 to 45%. And oil and gas sector, as Lena mentioned before, uh, is the only sector where the majority of the methane emissions can be reduced cost-effectively. This means that we can mitigate most of our methane emissions globally um, through oil and gas sector, and we have to do this quickly. Um, I want to conclude by saying that the actions need to be global. Uh, there are regional and country examples of successful actions on this already, but it's not uh, enough that one or two countries lead the way. We need um, all of the major oil and gas producing countries to do their bit in order to mitigate these emissions. Thank you for your time. Great, thanks very much, uh, Lena. Uh, any quick questions for Lena before we start the panel discussion? 
No? Uh, okay. Uh, we're good. The three um, virtual speakers are going to join us online, and I'll maybe have uh, Lena and Dan come up. I think there's a handheld. Okay. There's a handheld mic. I think you'll be able to respond to as you would like. Oh, there we go. You found it, Lena? Any uh, general questions for our speakers at this stage from either in person here or online? Is there anything online, uh, Emma? No? Um, feel free, anyone online, feel free to uh, put it in the chat box. I think we have a question for the audience here. Yeah, I, I have a question for Irina. Um, so you mentioned that about 3% of the sites generate 61% in emissions. So I was wondering, where are these sites located and do we know the companies that they are linked to? Thank you. Thank you for your question. It's a good question. Unfortunately, as this was part of a project, I cannot tell you the location of the sites. But I can tell you that from our experience, this is the phenomenon that we see happening over and over again uh, in different countries. So maybe the specific percent, 361, can vary from country to country, but this holds true. So there is a phenomenon called super meters uh, in the methane world um, of oil and gas, uh, which means that um, small percent of the equipment or the components of the sites are responsible for large uh, share of the emissions. And it is actually true for yeah, whatever site you choose. Even if you look at one specific site, you will have emissions, specific emission sources that are responsible for the large share um, of emissions. Sorry for not being able to give you a more specific answer on the location. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more questions uh, from the audience. Um, quick question then, I guess we're taking this to a much broader policy perspective since we're at COP27. Um, we've heard that there's three very important sources of black carbon and methane emissions from wildfires that you've just heard, wildfires, maritime shipping, and uh, oil and gas sectors. Um, I'm gonna ask each of the, uh, the uh, speakers to feel free to comment on if, uh, in your view, which sector or which sectors um, have the largest potential for significant uh, cost-effective emission reductions over the next decade. And just to keep in mind that um, are, are there bold actions being envisioned or implemented? And if not, how can this be advanced? And this is in connection with COP27 and the implementation agenda that is going on this uh, here. So we could start with, uh, did you want to say something, Lena, uh, to start? Okay, uh, online, sure. Would anyone like to comment on, uh, you want to start with the oil and gas sector, uh, Irina? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, this is just echoing what I just said. I think that personally, there is so much potential for further reductions in the oil and gas sector. And this is very much backed by our experience and for the limits are working specifically with developing countries where we've seen still a lot of need for increased capacity building, increased access to all of this new information and new exciting technologies that we are observing in North America and Europe, for example. Um, and this brings me to the second half of the question, Russell, on what needs, what kind of bold action needs to happen. I think a lot um, of potential lies within regions outside of the US and Europe. I think uh, there, the work has already been started and already uh, moving pretty quickly. It needs to continue, but we need to also accelerate action elsewhere in the world. So one is regional focus and two, I think industry cooperation, something around um, sharing lessons learned, sharing technology, sharing knowledge across the industry is something that I think will be very beneficial. So we have in all of the countries around the world, we have both international oil and gas companies present as well as national oil companies and increased cooperation between the two ability to share the latest know-how, uh, lessons learned from, for example, national companies with the national companies can 
really help uh, speed up mitigation. Thank you. Um, Lena, did you want to follow up? Yeah, please. So, you have to switch it on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yes, for, for the oil and gas sector, uh, I think it's important to remember that these are um, uh, the production is dominated by uh, not too many uh, companies that are so 80% is basically controlled by big companies, uh, more or less um, from, uh, from many of the, of the uh, rich part of the world. Uh, and uh, these, these emissions can be, the technology is there to uh, control almost all of these emissions. You can uh, recover most of the associated gas and you can also install, um, install the technologies for leak detection and uh, quick repair. Uh, and this is, the technology is there, but uh, the incentives to do it are lacking. So this is what's very urgent uh, that we get this in place, regulatory frameworks to actually achieve, um, force this, this industry to quickly clean up. Thank yeah. you. Very good, thank you. We'll turn to the uh, shipping sector and maybe Dan, would you like to comment and maybe Lisa after that? Uh, certainly, so I am the lucky or unlucky soul hmm. uh, who deals with uh, these three major short-lived climate pollutants. So we've got methane issues, we've got black carbon issues. Uh, we also potentially have nitrous oxide issues. Uh, if ammonia engines are brought into service in the marine sector. So uh, it, it's less about bold action in my mind. It's, all, it's more about a paradigm shift. Uh, mm -hmm. To date, the marine sector has been basically the dumping ground for the lowest quality fuels uh, available. That's what HFO is. Uh, so we need to shift from this idea that uh, marine uh, vessels burn the fuels that no one else wants uh, to them using uh, the existing distillate fuels that uh, are already being made and eventually moving towards uh, future fuels like ammonia and methanol. So uh, really, it's about, um, it's, about, uh, it's about cutting um, the use of HFO. So it's uh, of cutting black carbon emissions. It's avoiding methane slip from liquefied natural gas. And it's about carefully monitor, monitoring potential nitrous oxide emissions from uh, ammonia engines that are starting to be brought into the market. Okay, hey, thanks, Dan. Um, Lisa, did you want to uh, make a comment? Sure, please, um, I'd love to. So, um, as I said in, in my presentation, I think uh, one thing that can certainly be done is to uh, to have a mandatory measure to switch away from from heavy fuels to to distillate, and um, having our voice at the IMO is important to reiterate uh, the point uh, to do that. So I think um, um, having this voice will allow us to voice this over and over again at the IMO. So having a seat at, at the IMO for us is very important to, um, to constantly uh, say so. So I think uh, that's one thing that I can say uh, as an Indigenous person and as the first Indigenous organization uh, aiming for a permanent seat at the table at IMO. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Is she Jessica or uh, Villaveco? Uh, did you want to comment on the wildfires? Um, I'll start and then I'll see if Villaveco wants to um, add something. I think in general, um, across uh, all countries, people sometimes feel powerless about wildfires and how to do wildfire management and think that there aren't solutions and there are. Um, you know, in the Arctic and the boreal, um, you know, we, we know that some scribe burning, that indigenous cultural burning is really helpful for reducing fire risk, for um, 
maintaining the health of the biodiversity and and can even be beneficial for reducing permafrost thaw um, if an extreme wildfire comes through. Uh, we can't control lightning. We can control, you know, lightning is, of course, one of our ignition sources, but the humans are the, still the main source of ignitions in the Arctic and the Boreal. So we have, you know, policy management and community solutions um, to reducing a wildfire risk and extreme wildfire danger. Um, that means uh, changing um, our mindsets that we can actually thrive with fire and not just live with it. It's not cancer. It's not something we have to uh, sh shoulder through. Um, that, that fire is a part of our earth. It's a part of our environmental systems. And it's a part of our human systems. Um, and that's okay. And we should be looking at ways to reduce the impacts of black carbon and methane emissions. And what's really important, we didn't talk about it in our um, talk, but of course, I, I know at the Chrysler Pavilion, there'll be other presentations and have other presentations about why permafrost and methane uh, emissions from permafrost fall uh, because of wildfire impacts is so important. We actually don't need any high tech tools. We don't, we don't need any, any high tech solutions. Um, to, to manage and thrive with fire. Uh, we, we just need to uh, reinvest um, uh, our, in our communities and, and to change our mindsets and know that we can still thrive with fire. And that will include things like enhancing how we do wildland fire fighting if an extreme fire happens, but it also means prevention of fire um, in the future and, and working together. And I guess with that, I'll, I'll say, I feel like Becca wants to talk about collaboration, but I do think collaboration is really important for that. And ABC ICAP has been a very nice project to, to be able to collaborate across North America and Europe. Yes, I can just uh, basically highlight, you know, once again, what Jessica already said, but this that there are solutions already and there's a lot of experience on this, fighting this virus and the nuisance and whatnot. And Looking to the future and not necessarily even too far into the future, um, we are expecting new regions to get more fires, experiencing more fires. There's a lot of areas, a lot of people, a lot of expertise already on how to fight this fire. So these new regions can or already now kind of take these lessons learned from the uh, areas which have experienced these fires and how they, how they dealt with them and what they've learned already kind of be prepared for the future where we expect these things to be more common in new areas as well. Thank you. Um, I think we've heard from all three sectors now, so that was uh, very helpful. Um, in terms of follow-up question, any, any questions from the uh, audience here, both uh, in person or online, or anything that uh, our speakers have mentioned? Okay. Um, I know this. we touched on this already, but uh, we're just looking at what are the key hurdles preventing immediate actions to reducing black carbon and methane in, in all these sectors. Um, we've heard that there's technical uh, measures that, that already exist to reduce black carbon and methane emissions, but is there enough incentives, like economic incentives, uh, to reduce the emissions? Um, and if not, you know, what can be done now? Um, and this is... Uh, this is an important consideration because there's an immediate need to address uh, these short-lived climate forces at this time. And uh, we're just trying to uh, understand what the key hurdles are to take this to the next step um, for immediate action. Looks like Lena would like to say a few comments here. Uh, I can comment on, on that. Uh, so uh, one hurdle is that the monitoring technology uh, where we are now, um, for, I mean, for methane emission, it's only in the last few years that we have actually been able to uh, monitor um, methane using satellite uh, images. Uh, before that, uh, it was uh, it's possible to measure methane in the atmosphere, the concentration, but of course, then we don't really know where exactly it's coming from. And then you can also measure it uh, directly uh, from sites, but of course, then you are limited to in time and uh, to the to the lo uh, locally to the place. So, uh, so something that, uh, but this, the satellite uh, technology is very 
interesting because it's developing very rapidly now. Uh, right now, we can only see the really large um, events, so uh, roughly 10-15% uh, maybe of, um, of the really large, largest uh, of, of emissions. So, uh, but to increase that to uh, coming to 90-100%, uh, we would need other, um, there are these um, nano-satellite uh, networks that we hope will be in place in uh, maybe two, three, four years from now that would be able then to cover much more of the emissions. Thank you. Dan, did you want to comment uh, as well? Uh, certainly. So um, I think the question was originally uh, about economic incentives. Um, there we go. What we're facing in the maritime sector right now is uh, attempts to shift from fossil fuels to future fuels. Uh, and those will be low carbon fuels, um, including ammonia, hydrogen, potentially e-methanol. Um, and all of those fuels uh, will have a significant price premium, especially in the near term. Uh, so uh, in essence, we're starting to see regulations that will drive those future fuels. Uh, at the same time, uh, we do know that distillate fuel uh, is going to be a much cheaper fuel for the foreseeable future than any of those future fuels. Uh, and it will have significant uh, benefits in black carbon reductions. So really, the incentive uh, is already coming in the policies that will promote these future fuels. Uh, we just need to make sure that the, the life cycle accounting is done properly. Uh, that stretches across not only CO2, but these other co-pollutants. And... And I do suspect, I mean, it won't be the long-term solution, but in terms of a, a, a bridge fuel towards these future fuels uh, that will really scale after 2030, um, the incentive for distillate should be there. We just need to get the accounting of uh, these other climate forces uh, correct. Very good, thank you. Uh, Lisa, did you want to comment or we'll come back to uh, another more relevant question for you on human health, if you like. Uh, at, uh, at the next question. Did you want to comment right next, now? Next question, thank you. Okay. Thank I you. really liked the, um, uh, the last answer to, to yeah. the economic incentives question. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Uh, I'll turn to, I know it's a little bit, uh, just maybe hurdles. I don't know if there's sort of, for the economic uh, incentive perspective, is, is really relevant to the wildfire issue. I guess there is some aspects of that, but if you want to comment, uh, in terms of just hurdles to get through on the immediate term to take action, uh, uh, Jessica or uh, Villaveco, did you want to comment on that? Uh, I'll take those ten minutes. Okay. So I, I think in general, for policymakers, my message would be um, that we need more proactive management. We know that proactive management of wildfires uh, reduces the cost. Right. Reactive management is where we end up spending. Uh, you know, billions of dollars, billions of euros in uh, response to extreme wildland fire. And instead, we should be thinking about um, how do we incentivize uh, you know, prescribed burning, indigenous cultural burning? Um, how do we in incentivize the reduction of reckless emissions that lead to wildfires? Um, how do we um, make sure that we're communicating with the public, fire weather risk, fire fire risk itself so that they're not inadvertently starting um, fires. Um, and then of course, other um, on the ground fuels treatments um, and incentivize collaboration um, uh, across a uh, border, right? Because the Arctic and the boil are all connected. So how do, we, how do we work together? And if we focus on proactive management, um, we will actually reduce our economic costs because of the cost of wildfires. And then of course, the cost of that the short of climate forcers, the CO2 itself, um, and that that will uh, be reduced. Um, and of course, any climate action we take now to reduce warming will reduce wildfire risk, and that will reduce our costs. So it um, it's um, it's really uh, you know a very kind of straightforward solution, but it just changes that our, our the way we approach management from reactive to proactive, which is what I'm seeing from our colleagues here in shipping. Um, and in flaring, you know, thinking about how to do proactive 
monitoring and management and incentives. And we need that same thought for wildfires as well. Hmm. Levecco, did you want to add anything to that? Comment? Not really too much to add. Of course, there's the one going to build in uh, economic incentives. So forestry is an important economic activity in many, many places, such as Finland. So there's kind of this built in um, incentive to fight the wildfires before they happen already because of this reason. Uh, Irina, did you want to comment on the uh, from the oil gas sector in terms of uh, economic incentives, but also you had mentioned uh, is one of the key takeaway message, uh, the issue of education being an important aspect in terms of a hurdle to get over? Yeah, I, I think this is a good summary, Russell, but maybe um, just quickly on the economic side, um, I think some of the issue is this um, alternatives that the oil and gas companies are faced with, right? Uh, so they can invest this dollar in producing a barrel of oil, uh, extra barrel of oil, or they can uh, invest it in some new technology for monitoring methane emissions. And um, in many countries, actually, the value of gas is much lower than what we think it is looking at the price of natural gas right now because of some of the local mechanisms and contract structure and some of the other set regulatory uh, barriers. And addressing those can, I think, uh, increase the incentive that is there for the value of the gas. So if me as an operator producing oil and gas can also be remunerated uh, for my gas at the level of market prices, I might be more willing to take action to actually capture the gas and deliver it to the market rather than having a fixed or a very low uh, internal uh, national price on gas, which provides me no incentive to then capture and deliver it. I'll stop here. Uh, many more barriers to address. But. No, no, that's, that's good. That's very helpful. I think Lena just, just like to say a quick um, few words here. Yeah. So uh, if we can, um, if we get better monitoring uh, of emissions, uh, in particular for the oil and gas, because right now the voluntary reporting of emissions from that industry are very, very small. So it will be, become very important that we can actually also verify these emissions. Uh, because without that, it will be very difficult to uh, implement any binding uh, regulatory frameworks. So, um, so I, yeah. it's super important to know what the baseline is in order to then be able to claim the reductions and uh, monitor our progress. That's the point. Agreed. Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Lisa for this uh, next question. Um, uh, to comment on um, in terms of what are the costs of inaction, both from a black carbon and methane perspective. Uh, I mean, Lisa provided us with a very effective presentation on the painting a human uh, face to these issues. Um, and uh, we're just looking at how human health impacts are being taken into account um, when considering taking actions, immediate actions on uh, black carbon and methane. Uh, air pollution plays an impact here, not just the climate change, uh, certainly taking a lot of the attention, of course, on these issues, uh, but certainly air pollution impacts are important from a black carbon emissions perspective in particular, um, being major concerns, especially to Antarctic indigenous peoples, such as Inuit. Um, so maybe I'll just turn to, uh, to Lisa to, to say a few words. Uh, what can... ICC and other indigenous peoples uh, get more involved in terms of the decision-making process and policies to control emissions. Sure, thank you. Um, there's so much more that can be done for sure. Um, there's regulations that can that that uh, that uh, you know the shipping industry has has to follow. Um, for example below 60 degrees, um, there are um, emission control areas, um, but above 60 degrees, there, there isn't. Uh, so that's a huge discrepancy. I mean, there are people living above 60 degrees, so I couldn't understand why emission control areas wouldn't exist also above 60 degrees. Um, there was a ban of heavy fuel oil in the Antarctic, but not uh, in the Arctic. Uh, so there's, um, you know, unequal treatment.
and um, depending on the regions. And with the increase of shipping above 60 degrees, because of the melting of ice, there should be uh, emission control area uh, introduced um, for ships passing through the Arctic as well. Uh, so I think that's the, uh, the main thing that I can say for now, that that is lacking uh, at the IMO right now. So I think that's something that we really need to look at and that ICC pushes. We'll continue to push for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a wrap for our session here. Uh, the, we're planning for our next session coming up very quickly. So I just want to make uh, the last comments here and just want to thank all, all of our uh, speakers um, for their presentations as well as the panel discussion. They did a very, very good job. So maybe a round of applause for our speakers, uh, both online and in, in Peru. Um, the, um, the, I'd like to also thank our ICC uh, organizers, Pam, Emma, and Amy. They have done a great job. Uh, also, uh, Heidi Silverstein of the AMAP Secretariat and, uh, uh, and my co-project manager, uh, Simon Wilson, uh, with the ABC ICAP project. Uh, and finally, certainly our EU Fund funders um, from the FPI, the foreign policy instrument um, that was responsible for organizing this uh, this particular project. So um, recordings of this side event will be made available to those who registered, which is great. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the side events, starting with the next one. Um, so thanks very much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Have a great virtual day. speakers. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.